Good evening and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Bellingham Whatcom County Forum for candidates for the Bellingham School Board. My name is Jill Bernstein and I am proud to be your moderator for this evening's forum. The land that we stand on is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Lummi and Nooksack people, the original inhabitants of Washington's northernmost coast and southern British Columbia. Since time immemorial, they've celebrated and cared for their land and waters to perpetuate their way of life. Please join me in deep gratitude for their ongoing wisdom and guidance as we take a moment to honor their ancestors and acknowledge the past, present, and future Lummi and Nooksack people as the original inhabitants of this land. Our media partners are the Salish Current, the Ferndale Record, the Northern Light, the Linden Tribune, and KMRE 88.3 FM Community Radio. We thank them most sincerely for their support. Founded in 1920, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. To that end, we work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and also influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League never endorses a candidate or a party. Membership is open to both men and women 16 years of age or older, and we invite you all to join us. We say democracy is not a spectator sport. Membership information is available on our website. But now let's get started. Tonight's forum is for candidates for the Bellingham School Board. There is one seat on the ballot this fall with two candidates. Please allow me to introduce them. We have Katie Rose. Hello, Ms. Rose. Hello. And we have Aaron Clausen. Hello, Mr. Clausen. Hello. The five member Bellingham School Board has governance responsibility in these main four areas vision, accountability, structure, and advocacy. The school board believes that effective public school education must be directed towards common needs of all children, but must also consider the unique differences and needs of individual children. Registered voters elect board members for terms of four years. For tonight's forum, we will follow specific rules. There will be no opening statement. Instead, the introductory question is tailored to elicit responses consistent with opening statements. Candidates will have a minute and a half to respond to each question and will make a one minute closing statement. The order of questions and closing statements were determined before the forum began this evening, and each candidate has a challenge card. Show us your cards, candidates. Great. Uh, candidates may use this card to challenge or rebut their opponent's response. The challenging candidate will have 30 seconds to state the challenge, and his opponent will have 30 seconds to respond to the challenge. Each candidate may use their challenge card just one time. Our timer this evening is Judy Hopkinson. Hello, Judy, who will be tracking the time. The timer background will flash to yellow when there are 15 seconds left and then to red when time is out. The moderator, myself, will ask you to stop talking at that time if necessary but we ask that the candidates be respectful of the time allotted due to the limited amount of time that we have and our desire to include as many questions as possible. Members of the public were able to submit questions through the League of Women Voters of Bellingham Whatcom County website up until today. These questions were screened to ensure that they were not duplicates and were appropriately addressed to both candidates. So with the rules covered, Let's get started. Timer, are you ready? Ready. Great. And candidates, as I mentioned, you will each have a minute and a half to respond to the question. And our first question goes to Mr. Clausen. What differentiates you from your opponent? Oh, that's actually a great question. Um, so I believe everybody on the school board 
and Ms. Rose specifically is a parent, I believe you're very proud of your kids have all gone through the Bellingham School District. I don't have any kids or maybe equivalently, I have hundreds of them because I refuse to refer to my students that way. And I think probably it is safe to say that when I go look at the school, what I see are students first, since I have no experience with them in a parental role. I am very thankful for the role that the school board has played and I can respect uh, Ms. Rose's contributions. But what I would like to see is a school board that has different perspectives. And I don't think we should have a school board with everybody with my opinions. But I think my position is gonna be different than Ms. Rose and the other board members that are currently running. That's it. Thank you. And Ms. Rose, how would you like to answer the question? Um, sure. Well, thank you, Aaron, for telling me the ways that we're different. Um, I, I think that's great um, that you're running as somebody who doesn't have kids in the district. Yes, I do have two um, two kids in the district. Hello, Toby and Oscar, because I'm sure you're watching. Um, and I am proud of that. I'm proud of the education that they're receiving. But that's my kids are not why I'm on the school board. My background is in community building. And I believe in building a community where everyone has the opportunity to contribute and thrive. And our public institutions play such a key role in that. Um, and our schools play a tremendous role um, in that. So in that way, we might actually um, be a little bit more similar. I do think that my perspective as coming from the nonprofit sector um, is something that something different that I bring to the board. Uh, I have experience working with other large organizations and I can see how these issues are interconnected. You know, working at an organization that's fighting poverty, I can see just how deeply entrenched it is and how much it affects our students, our families, our community as a whole. Um, so that's the perspective I bring. So our second question is, how would you describe your vision for education in the district? And how does that vision support the economy and quality of life in the community? And this one will start with Ms. Rose. Great, um, love this question. I believe very strongly in the Bellingham Promise. Um, and I love the process that came to create the promise. It was a very community led um, piece. And the vision of that is we as a community make a collective commitment to Bellingham's children um, that we're going to empower every child and discover and develop their passions uh, and let them contribute to our community and achieve a fulfilling and productive life. Uh, I think as we heard from my first answer to the first question that that part of building a community where everyone can thrive is so important. I also though think that it's important to recognize that the school district is one of the largest employers in the county. Um, as such, when we have over a thousand employees, it's important that we be a great employer. Um, that's a huge part of how we contribute to our local economy. And so that means um, making sure our, our teachers and educators and staff are well paid and have great benefits. It means being engaged with our other um, community organizations and leaders to make sure we're looking at things like housing and poverty. Um, it's just so vital um, that we see ourselves as part of the community, not we don't stand alone as a district. We're part of this bigger whole. Thank you. And Mr. Clausen. Well, I can't actually disagree with anything that Ms. Rose has said. Um, I have read through the Bellingham Promise. The one thing I would underline is sort of where I started with, it starts talking about children and not students. Um, there is an ENDS report that talks about the um, students becoming, or the, the students becoming leaders. I volunteer with the Civil Air Patrol, and I've watched that program take 12-year-olds and put them in charge of other cadets and watch them accomplish some pretty amazing things. I could go on and on, but I'm watching that timer. Um, I would like to make sure or continue to make sure that students are met where they're at, 
that we can get them to the goals that are reasonable and attainable for those students and prepare them for whatever life is going to present to them or wherever they want to take it, wherever that is, military, trade schools, universities, or walk out with a high school degree and start their life with something else. I have a so, response about, I want those kids to go off and make a whole lot of money so I can retire and collect social security, but we'll move on. So graduation rates and academic achievement vary among different student populations. For example, 81% of students graduate high school, but only 43% of native students graduate in Bellingham. What specific plans do you have to address these disparities and improve overall student outcomes? And we'll begin with you, Mr. Clausen. Uh, you know what, you've picked a question that I am particularly weak on. Every student is unique. It's easy to talk about demographics and students who fit into a particular box having a certain particular graduation rate. But we're really talking about abstract concepts there. I would like to know what each student is is lacking in their life and what it is that we as a school district can provide to them to get them to the outcomes of the course or outcomes of the of the program. I don't have a turnkey answer or that silver bullet that will fix all students who fit into a particular demographic. So that's a terrible answer, but I don't have anything more specific than that. And Ms. Rose. Um, what a great question. I think, you know, one thing I'm proud of um, is seeing the shift in graduation rates in the district. We've made tremendous process progress, excuse me, with demographics, um, with particular demographics. And this is an area that I really like digging into when we're going through our reports. I think one of the key areas that I'd like to build on um, are our community linkages. So these are meetings where we bring together different members of the community, um, leaders from the community, and work together to find out how we can bet what the needs are and how we can work together to best meet those needs. Um, and I think that working with the local tribes is a really key component of that. Um, we wanna build a community that reflects and celebrates everybody's culture, right? And I think as a district, by partnering um, with tribes and partnering closer with communities, um, we have the opportunity to incorporate both those cultural lessons and see what we can do as a district to support them. They've done such tremendous work. Um, I think we have a lot to learn, and I would love to have the opportunity to sit down and figure out more ways we can work together. So please explain your philosophy on collective bargaining and labor relations with teachers and staff unions. Ms. Rose? Thanks. Um, I am the daughter of a uh, union leader in, for nursing. My mom's a, um, a retired public health nurse. And, you know, I think of collective bargaining as what helped me go to college. I think of it um, as what bought my parents' house. Um, I think collective bargaining plays such a key role in equity in our communities, um, in ensuring teachers have what we were talking about in the beginning, that they have the pay that they deserve for the work that they're doing. Um, you know, I think as my role on the board is to represent the needs of the community. Um, so we we listen to that. We listen to that very thoroughly. Um, and I think that our just our priority is to listen to the teachers, um, make sure we're getting them what they need. Um, recognizing that inherently a collective bargaining system does set up a dynamic that can be inherently um, adversarial, right? And so it's important for us to know what our values are um, as, as a district, as a community, so that we can find a common ground to work together um, to make sure that we're meeting everybody's needs. And Mr. Clausen. Well, I'm gonna tell a quick story. And if you listen really carefully, you can hear all of my students' eyes rolling in the background. Um, I do accreditation visits for ABET, the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology. I was visiting my school this year and they were telling me about how, you know, their enrollments were up and faculty, you know, workloads are going up and their class sizes are now two sections of 49, so 48 students per lecture. I'm capped at 35 or 40, depending on what level I am. So I asked them, I was like, well, doesn't your union have any say in this? And they said, our faculty aren't unionized. 
And I said, well, I'm protected by a union. And then I had to backtrack that. I'm like, I'm not suggesting anything. So I get to appreciate faculty unions as a teacher at Western. I have never been on the other side of the table, but I, I think Ms. Rose is exactly right with, you've got to come to an agreement that's beneficial for both sides and making sure faculty are supported in a way that's meaningful that they should be compensated for the work that they're doing in a way that allows them to enjoy their not work life. Um, but it is necessarily adversarial because it isn't a bottomless pit of money that the district has access to. And so you have to be good stewards of public funds. I don't know if that really answered the question, but I got a story in there, so it's all good. The next question, though, does go specifically to uh, money, which is that school funding is a perennial concern. What strategies do you propose to ensure that our schools have the necessary resources to provide a high quality education? And Mr. Clausen, you'll begin. To me, this is prioritization of the things that are important. And this is, I think, where Ms. Rose is going to be much better informed than I am because she's been inv involved with these budgetary discussions at a deeper level than I have been able to be at. Um, I have some interesting questions to ask about why the budget concern or the budget decisions were made the way they were. Recently, class sizes were voted to be increased. That surprised me. I can't tell you that decision is wrong, but I would have liked to have been. I would have liked to have understood the decision better. I'm surprised that staffing numbers are as high as they are, non-teacher staffs. And yet the promise of all of our technology is that those roles should become more efficient. So those ratios from my perspective should decrease over time. I would love to see class sizes kept reasonably small provided we have the budget to support that. And this is where I can't vilify the school board. These are tough decisions that have been made I'm just not sure I would have made those decisions. And again, I, there's probably more eloquent answers. And for that. And Ms. Rose. Yeah. Um, Karen is right. This has been a really pressing and frankly painful um, issue that we've been grappling with over the last few months. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that the state of Washington has an inherently inequitable funding system. Um, and that is one of the biggest challenges that we faced as a board in trying to make some of these decisions. Um, regionalization was a huge factor um, and we count on the state for the majority of our funding. And if those the funds are not keeping up with our cost of living, we have to make tough cuts. Um, we changed some of some of the positions that we were funding, um, you know, have changed over the course of the pandemic. With the pandemic, we increased our mental health counselors um, and our mental health support for students. Um, and I can tell you the impacts of, of the pandemic have not gone away for students. Um, dealing with middle schoolers, you can, you can really see firsthand um, how difficult and how hard it's been and so we had to make decisions. We had to keep mental health counselors because that need is still there. These are some of the tough decisions that we're grappling with, but it really does come down to a state issue. The state model is broken. And so I think one of the key things that we can do is partner with other stakeholders to do a better job of lobbying our legislators um, to fix this broken system. So the next question is, what are the two most critical educational weaknesses in your district? And what is your specific strategy to address those weaknesses? Ms. Rose. Good question. Um, that's a, that's, sorry, that's just a really good question. Um, I think one of the things that we talk about quite a bit is our need for vocational, tra uh, vocational training. Um, these sort of these technical educations. One of the things that we hear a lot, right, is college isn't the right choice for everybody, which is absolutely true. But I also would love to see us reframe that, right? Um, maybe it's nursing school isn't the right choice for everybody. Um, you know, my brothers are the smartest people I know, and one is a refinery operator and the other is a bus driver, and those are great choices for them. Um, they are the choices that let them have the life 
that they want. So what I'd like to see us do is continue our emphasis um, on growing these technical education programs. I'm very excited for a linkage that, um, that I'm in the process of helping put together, which is working with our local employers and local trade unions to put together a linkage so we can learn more as a district about what these needs are so that we can better meet them. Um, I think the other academic issue that we're facing right now is a loss of learning from the pandemic. Um, that's exactly answering the question, but that's an area that we need to focus on so we can get our kids caught up um, back to where they were and beyond. And Mr. Clausen. So I can tell you what I'm seeing at the university. And to be honest, not all of my students come from the Bellingham School District, but in the first years coming in, so my, so my freshmen and sophomores, there's a profound lack of study skills. And some of this we can point at the pandemic and say, well, they didn't have to for two years and they'd have to re rebuild those. I would also like to see, as Ms. Rose said, a, a greater opportunity for trade schools. I would put the military in their uh, university if that's the direction students want to take. I am troubled by a, I think this was at the state level to create classes at the high schools that students could walk out with college credit and they would take the class, not running start, but they would take the class within the high schools. That's not a bad plan, but that furthers that, that idea that to be a success, you have to go to university. And I think that's a failure for a lot of students. I also see this disconnect between um, this attitude that if my grade isn't an A, it might as well be an F. That the idea that there's this whole rainbow of success is lost on students until they come to my class. Um, and that's, I don't know how to fix that one in high schools and perhaps middle schools of allowing students to struggle a bit and realize they still succeeded without getting every single question correct. How do you plan to respond to parents who want specific changes in the school curriculum? And we'll start with you, Mr. Clausen. That's actually one of the things that motivated me to actually consider running in the first place is nationwide, and I can't point it at Bellingham and say, oh, you know, the world's coming to an end here, is this idea that um, I think parents need to be engaged in their students' education. But by and large, this pushing an agenda of I want something included or I want something excluded from my students' education, to me is, is fraught with peril. We have well-trained, well-educated teachers creating curriculum, and everybody is trying to get the students to a place where they can succeed in the world, hopefully wherever that takes them, trade schools, military, the university. Um, and to have a parent or a collection of parents come in and say, I would like to ex exclude, and I'm not gonna say anybody's suggesting we exclude math other than some of the students, but to have a group of parents come in and say, well, we should exclude math from the curriculum because I feel this way. I think that undermines the expertise of our teachers and folks who put together the curriculum to actually put together a plan that gets students to success. So how do I, what I ask to deal with the parents, I'd be very curious as to why they want something included or excluded but I would be reluctant to sort of abdicate that responsibility of cur curriculum crafting to a parent body. And Ms. Rose. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing that I would do um, is listen, because that's, that's my job, um, is to take in input from the community and hear what their concerns are. But the second step is to direct them right back to the school, because as Aaron said, I'm not an education expert. Um, our, the minds of children, right, are developing and growing. And part of what schools do is play a really key role in developing this brain architecture that will serve children for the rest of their life, right? That has a long lasting impact on the face of our community. And I don't know how to do that. My job is to make sure that the district is hiring people that do know how to do that. Um, so that's, um, I, I agree with Aaron 100%. Um, I believe that we want to have evidence-based, fact-based curriculum 
that does reflect our values as a community. Um, but first and foremost, our, our children should be learning facts. Um, it doesn't matter if it makes them comfortable. It doesn't matter if it's, it's we just need to teach the true history. Um, sorry, just went off on a little bit of a tangent there. Um, and the curriculum that teaches our children the skills that they need to succeed. Thank you. And how do you plan to ensure transparency and accountability in the school district's operations, including financial management and decision-making processes? Ms. Rose. That's a great question. And frankly, I think that this is probably an area that we as a board could improve. Um, we do we have really regular contact with the superintendent, you know, as board members, we meet um, usually at least once a month, we're going into schools, we're going, we're having community linkages, we're having student roundtables. Um, we do a lot uh, to see what's happening in the schools and to gather that communication. And I don't think we're always um, as clear or we don't make that as visible as we could. Um, the level of work that we put into our, our deliberations. Um, so if you do come to a board meeting, um, it can look like we haven't had a discussion. It can look like we just voted on something pretty quickly. And that's because we've put in the legwork kind of behind the scenes. And I do think that's something that we need to work on making more visible. Um, and that's something um, that I'm looking forward to heading up and bringing more to the forefront. And Mr. Clausen? Well, the board meetings are open meetings, the Open Public Meetings Act of Washington, which I've had to go through the training so many times. Um, the budgets are available. I think, as, as Ms. Rose pointed out, the deliberations, that's part where I'd like to see more of, and that's kind of what got me going on some of these budgetary decisions where it's like interesting, you know, knowing the, the players, I don't know how they got to that decision. I would like to know how. So making that more transparent when possible or more accessible when possible. But the reality is not everything is gonna be transparent. There are a number of things that have to be done in an executive session to protect the district, to protect the employees, protect students. So I think if the source of that question is, well, why can't I know everything? That's realistically just not practical. So what would I do about it? I, it's going to be the same answer. I would like to make everything as, a, as available as we reasonably can. And, you know, recorded conversations like this could help. So obviously, the district encompasses a diverse community. How will you ensure that all students, regardless of their background, have access to an equitable and quality education? Mr. Clausen. Well, I would love to see some of that equity and diversity in the people that we hire, in the topics that we're teaching. Um, and again, I can't tell you that it's not already happening, but I suspect we could do a better job. I am projecting what I see at Western. Um, I know there's a lot of questions that we ask our students at Western that is about where they're coming from, what they're experiencing, what they're learning, and what they're struggling with. I honestly don't know if we could apply that at primary and secondary education, but asking the parents might be a way to gather more information and make the, the offerings that the district is offering more available, more approachable to the students. And Ms. Rose. Yeah. Um, this question reminds me of one of um, my earliest memories of working of right, of being a student in public schools um, and how that kind of came back around as a parent. Um, one of my first and kind of core memories of my education is my third grade teacher um, dumping my desk over in the middle of class and telling the whole class that it looked like Kmart blown up. Um, as an undiagnosed student um, with ADHD. And um, I didn't have the skills to keep my desk 
organized the way that that teacher had that expectation. Um, and I realized going back into the schools how difficult it was for me to engage even with my children's teachers as I had this, this understanding of going in um, and trying to navigate this power dynamic. And that's why I think family outreach is so key and so important um, because we know that parents are our students' best teachers. Um, we need to be engaging with every family that we can so that we understand what the family's needs are uh, in addition to the children's needs. And that's, I think, how we build an equitable system. And so for our last question this evening, um, we know that bullying and student safety are often concerns in our schools. How would you work to create a safe and inclusive learning environment for all students? Ms. Rose? I think this is where um, the district's emphasis on social emotional learning has really come into play. Um, we need to teach kids from a very early age um, about their bodies, about what's acceptable, about managing their emotions. Um, I can tell you that having worked in the past with domestic violence and sexual assault services, one of the things I'm really conscientious about is power dynamics and teaching kids how to navigate those. I think teaching parents um, and families how to navigate those, teaching about equity. I think this is where um, visibility and inclusion pays, plays a really key role in our curriculum. Right. We need to teach children that everybody belongs. Right. Um, it's so key, I think, to help people feel included, to feel seen. Right. And to know that the person next to them has every right to exist and be and learn and be in the classroom as they do. Um, I think that's that's a big part of mitigating those dynamics that are really key. Um, and that's how I think we we really need to address bullying. And Mr. Clausen? I say, well, I agree with everything she said um, because it's right. There's another side to it, which is providing um, intervention services when instances of bullying or threatening behavior come in. You know, protecting the people who are the victims of, of I always go to cyberbullying because I teach computer science, but um, to make sure that the folks, the people who are impacted by this understand that they do belong. And you've got one person or perhaps two people who are making their life miserable, but that's not okay. But ultimately, you're exactly right. You know, teaching empathy, teaching an understanding that everybody gets to be here. Even if you don't feel comfortable being here, you do belong just like everybody else is the solution. But we do need to protect people. On that note, candidates, we are now ready for your one minute closing statement. And we will begin with you, Mr. Clausen. I have nothing prepared, so this is gonna be off the cuff. Um, I decided to run for school board because I wanted to be more involved. Nationwide, there are some trends that really concern me. Um, and I'm not saying anybody's planning on banning books in Bellingham, um, but that scares me. There's a bunch of arguments for ignorance and keeping students away from a particular education because, you know, as Ms. Rose pointed out, we're afraid of offending somebody or making somebody uncomfortable. But, you know, sometimes that's part of education is being uncomfortable and maybe being offended and challenging our preconceptions and, you know, reading something that you disagree with and then disagree with it and talk about it. I can't tell you that Bellingham School Board is doing a terrible job because I don't think that they are. I think they're doing a great job. I would like to be part of it, make, make those tough decisions. Thank you. And Ms. Rose. Yeah, um, I to say thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of geeking out a little bit about being at a forum. Um, I think League of Women Voters is just one of these great civic organizations that does so much to um, shape and form our community. And I thank Aaron for running, um, running for office and how running for office a second time has been just one of the more challenging experiences for me. And I'm um, just in awe of anybody who 
throws their hat in the ring. Um, and I have a 14 year old who would love to talk to you about Silvera Patrol. Uh, but <laughs> I, um, I think the biggest challenge facing our district right now really is this funding model um, that we need to work on at the state level that we need to bring people together to address. Um, and I hope that I have the opportunity to do that. Well, the League of Women Voters would like to thank both of you for your willingness to serve our community. In every way, this is of value to uh, not just the school board, not just the students, the teachers, but to all of us. And we, we are truly grateful to you. Um, voters, if you want more information about the candidates, you can look online at vote411.org and in your voter pamphlet. Ballots will be mailed on October 18th of this year. Your ballot must be postmarked or in a ballot drop box before 8 o'clock p.m. on November 7th. Please remember to sign the ballot envelope and if mailing by postal service, we recommend mailing early. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to the candidates for your willingness to serve. Good night, everyone. <laughs>